experiments and uh, in particular developed wind, wind warping uh, and gliders and a new powertrain. And out of this came the Wright Flyer. Okay. And so this is kind of a metaphor for, I think, where we lie today in uh, kinetics matter physics of quantum materials. Um, at the beginning of this century, quantum materials provide equally important insights into how we may understand and control the quantum physics of entanglement. Okay. And one of the key points here that is not understood very well today is a point that was made by Rolf Landauer, who was a, a, an expert in mesoscopics at IBM, but also fascinated uh, by the notion of quantum information. And one of the things he claimed, which I think is probably true, is that information is physical. Okay. It's not a human thing. It's actually something physical. And if that is indeed true, we don't really know what it is at the quantum level. Our colleagues up the hill use the word entanglement and quantum information in an interchangeable way, but actually that's not a legal thing to do. Um, so my main point is that when we come to quantum materials, we have fully operational systems with entanglement and 10 to the 23 fully operational qubits, okay? Uh, this is a number that's comparable with the number of stars in the visible sky, okay? even including the James Webb Telescope. Okay? Uh, and uh, so as such, <coughs> we have an, in, an environment now where we have access to very new novel phases of matter, high temperature superconductors, topological systems, fractional quantum ball systems, um, but we're also interested in their possible applications in the notion of quantum computers, um, designer quantum materials, such as twisted bilayer graphene, okay? And quantum phase transitions, which are of course states, which in some sense have infinite range entanglement. And so one of the questions that comes out of this is, what new conceptual frameworks can unify quantum information and quantum field theory and many body physics, okay? And the other important question to bear in mind, even though we are 100 years into quantum mechanics, is that like classical mechanics 100 years after Newton, quantum mechanics is surely incomplete. Understanding information and entanglement is a key component of the next stage of discovery. And it's always a good point at this point for me to ask you what was not known, what key concept of classical mechanics was unknown 100 years after Newton? Anyone know? You've all studied classical mechanics. I know, well, that's not fair. <laughs> Anyone who I haven't told or who has studied the, well, I'll tell you, it was the concept of energy, okay? concept of energy was completely unknown and was not established until the middle of the 19th century. And it wasn't established by Hamilton or Lagrange, but by the experimentalists, very carefully checking the interchangeability of heat into motional energy, macroscopic motional energy. And the reason Excuse they were missing this yes. is they didn't understand the emergent nature of heat as a form of motion. And so energy conservation appeared to break down in a practical sense until that was understood, okay? And so uh, we are no better than our classical forefathers. And it's very likely that quantum mechanics today is incomplete. If you ask me what I think is the incomplete element of it, well, I can't tell you because I'm, uh, I'm one of our time, but a probable area to understand is the nature, the physical nature of information. Okay. All right. So just to rub this in, I'm going to go on a little bit further <coughs> and talk about harbingers. Harbingers of the quantum age. Okay. We all know this, but it's good to think about it a little bit because there are other harbingers that we face today. Okay. So what were they? Well, I've just taken a selective list of them. Why do hot things change color? Why is matter so hard? Uh, why does the sun shine? Okay. Why is matter so hard? It can be rephrased as what is the origin of the reaction force that keeps you sitting in your chair? Okay. 
Newtonian physics gives a very nice description of a gravitational force pulling you down, and it in includes as a completely phenomenological object uh, the reaction force, because matter is hard, but it doesn't know where that reaction force comes from. And were your body made of bosons, you would slip through the chair. Okay. So uh, and let me remind you about these things. Why do hot things change color? Well, this led to the concept of the photon and black body radiation. And the hard work of this uh, entire generation of experimentalists and physicists in the 19th going on into the 20th century. And of course, the peak in the, uh, in the black body radiation is literally the point where the frequency is of order the temperature in the appropriate units, okay? Let's look at another example. Why is matter so hard? The fact that a, a, a book, Newton's Principia, can sit on a table can't be understood in terms of classical mechanics, okay? And the understanding of this came from a very unlikely direction. It came from the study of atomic emission lines, okay? Who would have imagined that those two things would be connected? And uh, the understanding of matter's hardness grew out of atomic emission lines leading to the Pauli exclusion principle, uh, which is the origin of hardness and chemical diversity. Here's a good old uh, Enrico Pauli uh, writing to uh, Aaron Schrodinger. This is an English translation. Uh, saying that with a heavy heart, I've concluded being converted to the idea that Fermi Dirac, not Einstein Bose, is the correct statistics. He was disappointed by this, but he went on to write uh, a note on Pauli paramagnetism, and he spent the rest of his life uh, dissing uh, uh, condensed matter physics as squalid state physics or something to that effect, uh, dirt physics. In fact, the field prides itself in the interesting physics that comes from dirt physics. And uh, in fact, it was probably perhaps Heitler and London, who really understood this very carefully. They combined uh, Schrodinger's physics with the Pauli exclusion principle, and uh, they realized that they could then ex understand the hardcore repulsion between atoms in terms of the Pauli exclusion principle <coughs> as you bring two helium atoms together, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the pushing the electrons up into the anti-symmetric level raises the energy. Some people say that it's got nothing to do with the Coulomb interaction. Actually, that's not true. The power exclusion principle and the Coulomb interaction are intimately connected with one another because by forcing those electrons into the anti-symmetric state, you reduce the electron charge between the two, uh, between the two ions, uh, and that causes increased propulsion between the, ion, the, the protons. Okay, so, so, but nevertheless, it is a result of the exclusion principle. Um, and to think of my last example, which is the question of, uh, and of course we encode that nowadays as a piece of algebra, uh, the anti-commutation of the field operators, okay? And why does the sun sign so slowly? This was a debate that, uh, which uh, involved the greatest physicists of their generation. And uh, <coughs> here is a, uh, 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 a copy of, um, a publication in Macmillan's magazine from March 1862. What is Macmillan's magazine? Come on, you all know what it is. It's nature, okay? Okay, um, it was owned by Macmillan for more than a hundred years. It's now owned by Springer, okay? Um, uh, and uh, he made an estimate, Lord Kelvin, William Thompson, and using the physics of time, confidently estimated the age of the sun to be 20 million years. Um, he had a gravitational collapse model of the sun, okay? Um, uh, that's because he abandoned chemical energy because that gave it even shorter time period, okay? Um, uh, but this led to a great debate. Uh, it led to a quarrel with geologists and with Charles Darwin who estimated a number closer to 500 billion years. And we now know that's a gross underestimate, okay? It's several billion years. And uh, of course, later on, it was discovered that the sun shines because of nuclear fusion. Um, but even with the understanding of nuclear fusion, it wasn't understood why the proton-proton collision rate was so incredibly slow, okay? Accepting that that's a consequence of the weak interaction, which is incredibly weak. But why is the weak interaction so incredibly weak? Well, that answer couldn't be provided by the particle physics of the 1960s or the early 1950s, I should say. Uh, and, uh, uh, <coughs> In fact, by the end of the 
50s, particle physicists had largely given up on field theory. And the clue to the next way forward came from a study of superconductors. Okay. Um, so um, just as an aside, <coughs> a typical proton inside the sun waits nine, bri nine billion years before fusion, which is good because it means that our sun is still very young. Okay, right? It's only about five billion years old. Oh. Um, <coughs> and so the short range nature of the electroweak force and the Meissner effect share a common mechanism. And uh, uh, this is because a gauge field acquires mass and is weakened, okay? And this weakening occurs via the Anderson-Higgs mechanism. In the case of superconductors, it's a charge pair condensate. In the case of uh, the electroweak, it's a hypercharged Higgs condensate, which means almost nothing, because we've no idea what the Higgs field actually is, whether it's microscopic or whether it has an inner structure. Okay, it's a pure phenomenology. Okay, whereas the charge pair condensate is not a phenomenology, it's related to uh, what we understand about quantum mechanics at a microscopic level within condensed matter. And of course, uh, <coughs> these two things come with a length scale. There's a length scale penetration depth of a superconductor. Uh, there's also the electroweak penetration depth of our universe, which are separated by a good uh, 11 orders of magnitude, but really have the same common origin. Okay. And uh, uh, Higgs based some of his early work on Anderson's uh, ideas that you could extend the notion of, of massive gauge fields from the case of the superconductor to the Yang Mills theory. And he built on that idea. So these then are three examples of harbingers of the quantum age. Uh, and in each case, laboratory based studies were used to reveal deep concepts that apply equally to the laboratory and to the cosmos at large, okay? And so one of the things we should think about today is whether that still holds. Maybe it doesn't hold, in which case you need to build bigger and bigger telescopes, uh, bigger and bigger accelerators, or maybe there are things that could be discovered in the lab today that are not only important for our understanding of quantum matter, but perhaps important for uh, uh, revealing deep issues, deep properties of quantum matter that are relevant perhaps to quantum information, perhaps to our deeper understanding of the universe at large. Okay, so that's the kind of thesis that I want to leave you with before going on to more detailed discussion, okay? There's a deep link between the laboratory and the cosmos, and it applied in the, uh, uh, in the 17th century, it applied in the 20th century, and it probably applies in the 21st century, or did that deep link suddenly come to an end at the end of the 20th century? Very unlikely, okay? Right. So it's with that thesis that we should talk about, uh, talk about the situation today, okay? And so let's talk about some of the dark matter challenges of the solid state, which perhaps are connected with principles of emergence uh, that we need to understand and which perhaps will reveal emergent properties of the universe at large. And of course, dark matter is a coin of phrase that comes from uh, 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 astronomy. Uh, and it's now very well established that there is some uh, ephemeral dark matter that lives across our universe that is uh, not lumpy, but very, very smooth and only interacts uh, with our part of the universe via the energy momentum tensor, as far as we can tell. Okay. That's what dark matter is, uh, uh, but there's also dark energy and 94% of everything, the background mass energy density of the vacuum is completely unaccounted for. That is a truly mind boggling uh, harbinger of our current age, okay? 24% um, is this dark matter that, that forms this very smooth stuff that causes uh, uh, galaxies to have unusual rotation uh, spectra. And 70% is uh, what's producing the acceleration of the expansion of the universe revealed in the high Z, uh, the high Z uh, surveys of distant galaxies. Okay. Um, and it's completely, un it's not understood at all. And a great deal of money is going into trying to detect the interaction of dark matter with uh, uh, our world. Um, and uh, Many of the theories that have been put forward there, such as the superfluid model of dark matter, are inspired by condensed matter physics. Okay. Okay. So this is a major challenge to 21st 
century physics. But does that mean that there aren't equally important challenges in condensed matter physics? Well, I would try to say that there are equally important challenges. And one of those is just staring us in the face, the fact that uh, since 1987, we failed to understand this beautiful linear resistivity in the cuprates, by which I mean, we have not developed a consensus theory that we can all use to create predictions and to move forward and understand in the context of the cuprates, the heavy fermions, and in the context of the, uh, the, the twisted bilayer graphene uh, and other systems that display the same linear resistivity. Okay? And this is the breakdown of the Landau Fermi liquid in a fashion that we don't understand at this point. Okay. And I'm going to tell you a bit today about my fascination with this strange insulator, samarium hexaboride, um, which I first got to know as an undergraduate, as a graduate student rather. And uh, uh, here you can see its resistivity as a function of temperature, which shoots up at low temperatures. And here you can see it as a function of one over temperature and it levels out at low temperatures. This leveling out turns out to be quite fascinating. Um, uh, but even more fascinating is the claim, uh, not entirely reproduced, uh, that this system exhibits bulk quantum oscillations, which have been interpreted in terms of neutral Fermi surfaces. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, why then am I putting this up here? Well, the reason I'm putting it up here is that some other systems, some other insulators have also exhibited these same quantum oscillations. And, uh, uh, in parallel with it, we have some peculiar solvable models of many body systems, which seem to have certain features in common with these bulk Fermi surfaces inside something resembling an insulator. So uh, these are two examples of dark matter challenges. And uh, these are only two selective ones. These and many other examples suggest the potential for qualitatively new advances in our understanding of quantum matter. Let me take you through a few examples. Uh, that are important and to remind you the fact that what we're really talking about here in many of these systems is the crossover between localized and delocalized behavior. We heard this fascinating discussion this morning in, on, in, in uh, Andrew Chubikov's talk about when can you use the spin fluctuation itinerant picture and when can you use the localized moment picture and what do you do when you're halfway in between and what do you do when part of your system is localized and part of your system is delocalized? This is a debate that began in the 1930s and is still going on today. It was a debate started by Piles and Mott and then later Anderson and Slater. Uh, and it, this is the battleground of our understanding at the moment, this competition between localization and delocalization. This here is a beautiful diagram uh, of the periodic table reorganized by Komet, Co and Smith in 1983 to show the central uh, <coughs> rows of the periodic table organized according to increasing localization vertically. And, in, and of course, due to the actinide or lanthanide or the transition metal contraction, localizations are running horizontally. And the, the coloring here just shows that when you have, uh, when, when you have elements, uh, the uh, unfilled shells of the electron C form a nice metal down on the right hand bottom left hand side here, and they form conventional superconductors. But on the top right hand side, if you go to uh, materials such as dysprosium or gadolinium, their unfilled F shells form nice local moment magnets. Okay. And of course, when you take these elements and you make compounds out of them, the crossover region is something of great interest. And that's where all the interesting stuff develops. And so uh, the cuprates, what happened there? Okay, yeah, and here is the, uh, the contrast between waves and magnetic moments. And of course we have systems such as the cerium heavy fermion systems, the actinides, uh, iron-based superconductors, and ir the iridates, which are kind of at the crossover, okay? So these are electrons at the brink of localization. And we know that new kinds of quantum matter develop at the brink of localization. Okay, any questions? Yeah. And here is another example of a, of a, of a strange metal, uh, which I love because it, cerium cobalt indium five is a miniature uh, high TC system. Uh, it, uh, in, if it were, discussed in Japan, it would be called a bonsai high TC system. It's a miniature version 
in Japan, they have these miniature trees, which look just like full sized trees, but are actually just 100 times smaller. And so serum co cobalt indium 5 is similar to that. It has a TC of about 2 Kelvin. Um, uh, and instead of going up to 1,000 Kelvin, up to 15 Kelvin, you see beautiful linear resistivity. Um, uh, <clears throat> and uh, there are some departures from linearity. You can see at low temperatures in the, in the AB plane. OK. And this is the thermal conductivity, which uh, also is linear. OK. And along the C-axis, it's the most perfect uh, linear resistivity we've ever seen. The intercept down here is a hundredth of the maximum rise here, which tells you that this linear resistivity has got nothing whatsoever to do with disorder or any such thing. Okay? So this is an issue that you might want to consider if you're interested in SYK models, I would say. But anyway, um, okay. And uh, we know from applying in an illegal way the Druda theory that this linear resistivity means we've got a uh, transport scattering time, which is basically given by the inverse uh, thermal energy, the Planckian scattering rate. Um, <clears throat> and, but we don't really know where it microscopically comes from. And uh, in the old days, in fact, I remember he being here when Andre Ruckenstein introduced the marginal Fermi liquid theory roughly around 1990 here in Trieste. It was a beautiful talk. And it's uh, frankly, just as good a theory as the modern uh, uh, ADS-CFT theories of, uh, of, of Planckian dissipation in the sense that neither fully gives us a microscopic theory at this point, in my opinion. And of course, these things seem to be in many cases connected with quantum criticality. Uh, certainly in the case of, of tunable heavy electron systems, you can tune them for a quantum critical point. Serum cobalt indium-5 and ytterbium rhodium-2 silicon-2 are nice examples of this. These are systems which, in which the length scale and time scale of the quantum fluctuations diverge. And we still don't understand how to describe this divergence of length and time scales in a metallic system. We understand it pretty well, I would say, in the co context of insulators, but metals, it's a big issue, I would say. Hmm. Okay, and of course, uh, what we do see is a new kind of metal, a strange metal with a linear resistivity seems to form in the quantum critical fan. Okay. So, um, so bringing that all together, uh, here's another example of, uh, of uh, such strange metal behavior in the iron-based superconductors. It's not so perfect in terms of linearity, but in these systems, as in the case of the cuprates under some situations, you can actually see an interchange between linear in T and linear in magnetic field. Um, and uh, this is an ongoing developing mystery that uh, is not fully understood at the moment. Okay. And of course, all of this, it seems to be linked with high temperature superconductivity in the cuprates, the iron base, the 4F ceriums. And nowadays you could probably also put into this the, uh, the flat band twisted Marais systems, which also exhibit similar features. So this then is a lineup of the dark matter challenges of the solid state. It's the selective one, um, but these and other examples suggest the potential for qualitatively new advances in our understanding of quantum matter. And this means we have to seek new conceptual ideas. You can't keep going back to the old framework and start hanging everything on it. You've got to spend part of your time thinking about new ideas that are risky, but enable you to come up with new suggestions for experiment that might take you to a new world of understanding. And we're interested in new forms of electron entanglement new kinds of quantum phase transition, new kinds of broken symmetry, the interplay with topology and the concept of fractalization. It's on those last two topics that I want to spend the remainder of this talk. Okay, questions? Anyone on the chat?
probably Andre. There's five. I can't. I can't get to it. I'm not going to try it. So I'm going to talk about the curious state of Samarium hexaboride. Okay, and uh, this will connect up a little bit with some of the things that uh, that uh, Alexei was talking about last week. Okay, and this is the uh, the, the material. It's uh, a cubic system, and the uh, little the blue spheres here are samarium ions. And what's important about samarium ions is that they contain localized uh, moments, F electrons. If you make the same material out of lanthanum, you have, um, if you make the same thing out of lanthanum, you have a perfectly good metal, a metal that used to be of great techno technological importance as a cathode in cathode ray tubes, because um, it has a low work function. But remarkably, if you put the samarium in it, it becomes an insulator at low temperatures. Whereas with lanthanum, it's a perfectly good metal at low temperatures. Okay. And uh, <coughs> these are the local moments. And uh, uh, it has this small insulating gap that develops at low temperatures. And you can see uh, the behavior better in the context of the inverse temperature plot here, and you can estimate the, the size of the gap. I forget where I've got it down here. It, it's, the, the gap is about, uh, it's not written down here. The gap is about 20, uh, 20 getting it wrong, about two millivolts, 20 Kelvin. Okay. okay, and so one very, very naive interpretation of this system is as a condo lattice. Um, it's a, a gross oversimplification because there are valence fluctuations. Nevertheless, it provides you with a cartoon understanding of the problem, because if you have a condo lattice, uh, then the interaction of the local moments with the electrons uh, is <coughs> a, uh, a running coupling constant, and it renormalizes so that it runs to strong coupling. And if you're then so naive as to understand it that way, you can then just solve the one impurity model with a very large J, and that then gives you a singlet at each side. Okay. If you then look at that model, you can either pluck out an electron uh, to create an un, uh, unscreened local moment, or you can uh, add an electron to also create an unscreened local moment. And when you do that, those excitations cost an energy of order J, and they produce a mobile, uh, mobile carriers. And so this is, in some sense, uh, like a regular band insulator, but in which the spins behave as spin one half excitations, converting the system to a filled band insulator. They count as spin a half excitations. And in some sense, this is an early example of spin fractalization. This is a model in which, uh, by conventional counting, you would have a metal. But if you count each spin one half as a particle, as an electron, you actually understand the system as a as an insulator. And so it challenges us in two ways. Number one, it looks as if we should think about this as a fractionalized system. But number two, uh, we're then puzzled why neutral spins produce charged heavy fermions. So two processes going on in this system which challenge us, uh, one of which is uh, the emergence of a gauge field, and the other of which is, is the locking of that gauge field to the external uh, electromagnetic field uh, via Higgs mechanism. So it's quite a challenging system to understand. Okay, anyway, uh, so uh, the other interesting thing about this system is that it's got this plateau in the resistivity, which never went away. No matter how pure you made the samarium hexaboroid, this plateau never disappeared. And uh, no one understood it, but with the emergence of the idea of topological insulators, it raised the interesting question whether <coughs> whether this system might be an example of a strongly interacting uh, topological insulator, which we uh, glibly called a condo in a, a topological condo insulator. This is the work I did with Maxim De Zero, Kai Sun, Victor Galitsky. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, it turns out that uh, to a good approximation, this seems to explain a lot of the physics in this system. Let me show you the idea. The idea is that there's a topological phase transition uh, in which 
you take a D band and cross it through a narrow band F electron system. And <coughs> this band crossing uh, then changes the parity at the X points, there are three X points, minus one cube gives you a topological insulator, which then guarantees that you should get uh, Dirac cones on the surface. In fact, three of them, if it all goes well. And this seems to be borne out by experiment. Uh, uh, <coughs> for example, uh, you can see the, 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 the Dirac dispersion on the, on the, on the surface. The uh, Hall constant derives just from the surface, which you can tell from doing wedge measurements. You get non-local, the surface is conducting. And you can even see the predicted uh, bands on the 111 surface. Everything looks right for this to be a topological insulator. And it has a remarkable bulk resistivity. Uh, you can measure the bulk uh, uh, resistivity. There's a problem here, right? Because it's got conducting surfaces. So how do you measure the bulk resistivity of a, of a topological insulator? Uh, if you do it conventionally, your resistivity measurement is always shorted out by the surface. And so uh, uh, the group at, um, <coughs> at, uh, Un at University of Michigan came up with a non-local Corbino measurement in which they injected the current and, and measured, the, uh, measured the voltage drop remotely. Um, and from this, they could pull out the bulk resistivity. And if you believe their results, uh, they say that the resistivity, uh, this is where it, it saturates, uh, it, where the saturation occurs in the bulk resistivity, in, in, in the measured, conventionally measured resistivity. But if you extract out the bulk resistivity, it goes on up through five more decades. So this is a, a very good bulk insulator. Um, but it turns out that that nice picture doesn't seem to explain all the properties and provides an, an enduring mystery um, because it seems to be an insulator with a Fermi surface. And this is where you have to try to make that Galilean extrapolation. Uh, we're not quite sure how good the various experiments are. We're not sure how all of them are reproducible. So we've got to take uh, our <coughs> insights from the body of experimental results, not just relying on one on their own, okay? So let's <coughs> um, talk about that. These are the two viewpoints about this system. Here is the resistivity. Here is the resistivity with this very nice plateau. Uh, is that a topological condo insulator? And is that the end of the story? Is it a band topological insulator? And, uh, and this is the uh, body of results that supports that idea. But let's, <coughs> but let's look at some of the weird properties. Here is the, here's the specific heat capacity of this system. And uh, you can see something fascinating. Here is lanthanum hexaboride, the very same structure with lanthanum atoms. And here is samarium hexaboride. Okay. And you can see that there is an excess of specific heat, even at the lowest temperatures. This excess comes from the local moment, okay? Uh, is the entropy of the local moments. But what's really fascinating is that the linear, is a specific heat capacity, this is C over T, uh, is linear at low temperatures. Uh, it has a bulk linear specific heat that's about 10 times that of lanthanum hexaboride. Okay. It's also an AC metal and a DC insulator. Um, here you see the optical conductivity measured optically, and uh, here you see the uh, <coughs> conductivity coming down at low temperatures, but it never quite goes to zero. You don't see a nice gap here, as you might have expected. Um, and uh, <coughs> if you try to estimate the dielectric constant in this system, it exceeds 600. Here are the, um, here are the uh, uh, quantum oscillations in the magnetization. Uh, uh, um, and uh, uh, you can see uh, both low frequency oscillations and high frequency oscillations up here. Uh, and uh, the lichitz kosevich uh, form is very nicely obeyed. And one other thing, you can see the torque in the bulk susceptibility. So these are oscillations in the bulk susceptibility. Okay. And this led to the Cambridge group uh, claiming that there is a both small and large pockets uh, in the Fermi surface pockets, even though this thing is an insulator.
And these oscillations resemble lanthanum hexaboroid. There's a lot of controversy around this. Some groups have suggested that these low frequency oscillations here come from aluminium because one way of making smerum hexaboroid is to grow it in a flux of aluminium. However, the measurements that were carried out here were made using uh, uh, smerum hexaboroid that was grown in an image furnace. There was no aluminium there. And so uh, uh, that explanation can be ruled out. These low frequency oscillations have been reproduced by other groups, but the high frequency ones corresponding to the large Fermi surface have seen by the Cambridge group have not been reproduced. Okay, so these are the two viewpoints about this system, one of which is it's a topological condo insulator, a viewpoint that would have been regarded as radical some years ago, but seems to be well established by many points here. And then there are the bad actor aspects, the linear specific heat, the uh, quantum oscillations, the AC metal DC, uh, uh, DC conductor that uh, pose real problems. Okay, so maybe only one of these pictures is right. Maybe there is a competing phase that exhibits in this system may be induced by the application of a field. And it raises the interesting question, could there be two competing insulating phases with different kinds of spin fractalization? So I'd like to end by talking about <coughs> a, a model condylatis with a neutral Fermi surface. And uh, I can do this in cartoon version, but I can also do this with a little bit more uh, detail. Perhaps I'll spend a bit more detail on this, uh, switch to a more another more detailed seminar talk that takes you into this. But let me first begin by uh, reminding you about the concept of fractalization. Um, so fractalization is the emergence of excitations with fractional quantum numbers. And the classic example of this are the domain walls, the solitons of polyacetylene, uh, uh, as established by Sue Schrieffer and Heger in 1980. When you have these domain walls, you have charge zero spin one half excitations that are mobile, very heavy. Um, <coughs> the other classic example are anions in the fractional quantum hall effect. <coughs> Work of Roba, Schrieffer, and Wilczek back in 1983 uh, established the fact that these fractally charged excitations these zeros in the Laughlin wave function uh, have fractional statistics. Okay. But what we've heard about a lot in this, uh, in this uh, meeting uh, here is the spin version of fractalization. And it's here where I think fractalization is, is particularly well established. The idea that magnons in a spin uh, one half Heisenberg chain fractalize into spinons. Um, and this is the, the comparison of experiment with theory in the S of Q and Omega in a 1D spin one half Heisenberg chain. Um, and uh, uh, so, but another context in which this idea of fractalization is relevant is in the context of the condo lattice. And this is a very uh, unconventional view of the condo lattice that I'm now going to present. The conventional view of the condo lattice is that its Fermi liquid behavior is related to the fact that on Earth, all condo lattices are derived from local moments that come from electrons. But the condo lattice model, as it stands, is a mathematical model where the origin of the local moments is undefined. It could be local moments as qubits. It could be nuclear moments with a very strong hyperfine coupling, or it could just be a, uh, uh, a calculation you've given to your, uh, to your graduate student, do a tensor network calculation on this and tell me what you find, okay? Um, the point is the appearance of a large Fermi surface in the condo lattice is a signature of fractalization. And it's something that we can understand very clearly in the context of the large n limit of the condo lattice. And the point is that, or, or the strong coupling limit of the condo lattice. <coughs> condo singlets mean that we have an insulator and we can dope it. And when we do that, when we think about this system, <coughs> when it's undoped, we have 
a Fermi surface of electrons. And then we have the additional contribution to the Fermi surface coming from the local moments. <coughs> and the net combination of this leads to no Fermi surface. <coughs> we can connect this up with Oshikawa's theorem, which basically shows that in the condo lattice, that if you have a Fermi liquid, then you will have a Fermi surface that counts the number of electrons and the number of uh, spins. And so this is the classic view of the condo lattice. We think of the spins as fractionalizing into an incompressible fluid of heavy fermions of F electrons. And these things hybridize with the conduction electrons. This little cartoon actually has a great deal of subtle, subtlety beneath it. This, you can find this cartoon, by the way, in, uh, I think it's, it's, it's present in a, in a paper by, uh, by <coughs> Neville Mott from the late, from the early 1970s. But in the context of the condo lattice, it's rather interesting because these are spins and to represent them as F electrons requires that you fractionalize the spins, okay? Uh, such a system uh, will have, a, an, 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 and in order to do that fractionalization, you're actually introducing an underlying uh, gauge field. <coughs> that gauge field then interacts with the physical electromagnetic gauge field and that subtle interaction involves a Higgs mechanism, which drives the F electrons into becoming charged particles. Okay, otherwise you wouldn't get an insulator. Okay, so that's uh, the condo insulator as viewed by Enrico Fermi. Okay, but of course this decomposition of the spin operator is an assumption. It's good in the larger limit, but it's not guaranteed at spin one half. Okay, and so. Uh, uh, there was another way of doing this, which is to think about the problem in the language of Majorana fermions. And so the condo insulator, if you think about the uh, electrons, the conduction electrons as Majorana fermions, you have four Majorana fermions interacting with four Majoranas of the F electrons. And so this is our picture of the condo lattice as viewed by Enrico Fermi. Let us now uh, look at the condo insulator as viewed by Ettore Majorana. So in that context, uh, we would be looking for a different description of the spins. This is an equally good way of writing a spin operator in terms of a vector of Majorana fermions. It's mathematically correct. And in fact, unlike the first way of doing it, which involves a constraint, which says that the number of F electrons is one, this second way of doing it actually doesn't involve a constraint but it nevertheless involves an underlying gauge field because you can change the sign of these eta's here without changing the s. This is underlying Z2 gauge field behind this. And so if this description becomes valid, if you have a Majorana fractalization of the spins, then what happens is that the spin is now represented by three Majoranas, not four. So let's look at what happens to this picture now. Come on. Yes. So here you see I've got three F electrons or three Majorana fermions connecting up with three electrons, right? But the problem is that the electron fluid contains four Majorana fermions. And so one gets left behind, which means that you get a gapless Majorana band. And this kind of situation was something that we've been playing with. Alexis Felic, myself, and in the 1990s, uh, Eduardo Miranda, for a long time, we just plug in this perfectly good representation of the spins, and lo and behold, we always got a gapless Majorana band out. Okay? We even wrote a paper on this in 1993 or 1994 entitled, Why Are, Cond Are Condo Insulators Gapless? Uh, and uh, then we got confused by our mean field theory because it seemed to look like a superconductor. And uh, uh, we rephrased the work and published it as, a, as an example of odd frequency triplet pairing, okay? So in the context of the Smeramix board, this has led us to reconsider the situation, okay? And this is the model, which Alexei told you about last week, the Yao Li spin liquid in three dimensions with a condo lattice. And maybe I spend a little bit of time showing you a bit more details about that.
<coughs> so, um, so let me show you this uh, Yao Li model. It was asked this morning in, uh, in <coughs> the talk of Hai Yong Ki, are there higher examples of, of, of uh, spin liquids? And uh, Hai Yong Ki told us yes, uh, but she said, I don't regard them as very physical. And I want to actually give an opposing viewpoint. Okay. Um, and first and foremost, this is a way for us to look at a completely gapless spin liquid, which is exactly solvable, okay? And we'll discuss later whether it might occur in reality, okay? So here's the model, has this grotesque structure, okay? It's actually a cubic structure, not at all obvious. It's, a, it's actually a body-centered cubic structure. And at each site on the BCC lattice, you have this little spiral of four atoms. There's a chiral lattice, okay? And it has a uh, this classic uh, trivalent structure of a Kitaev model, which makes it solvable. And in this model, the spins of the Kitaev model are now the orbitals of the Yao Li model. They're labeled by the lambdas, okay? And the lambda-lambda interaction is just like it is in a conventional uh, uh, Kitaev model, but now it is decorated by a spin interaction sigma dot sigma okay so there's the spins and there's the orbitals okay and this model produces a spin liquid with gapless spin excitations with a fermi surface okay and it's exactly solvable and why does that work out well the lambdas uh, gap out and form bond variables just like in the kitaev model but the spin degrees of freedom actually fractionalize as Majorana fermions. And so uh, uh, <coughs> you can actually rewrite this model as a gauge theory field. And unlike the Kitaev model, it's, it's a Z2 gauge field. But now instead of having one Majorana fermion, you have a triplet of them. Okay. And these triplets define the uh, spin degree of freedom. When you flip a spin, you don't create a vison in this system. The visons, uh, the, this is the Z2 gauge field. And the visons live uh, on these loops, which in this interesting structure, uh, where is it? Oh, it's come, there, there's the vison, okay? It's this structure that, it's a loop of, of, of sites in this particular system. And so at lower, low temperatures, you can replace the UIJs here by one, a unit matrix. In fact, this system has a, uh, a Z2, uh, phase transition, uh, which runs at around point, about 1% uh, of K. And below that temperature, the visons have a mass and the fractalization is perfect. That's the Yao Li model. And it's interesting to us because we would like to, and, and this is the Hamiltonian for it, just to show it to you. And it's interesting to us, uh, and here is the Fermi surface. It's a Majorana Fermi surface. Um, <clears throat> the Majorana unit cell is one half the electron unit cell in momentum space, uh, and it's a nice cube. Okay, that's the Yao Li model, and it's a very beautiful model. And if we take it uh, in three dimensions, we have a beautiful example of a spin liquid, a spin liquid made up of spin one fermions. Okay, so now let's couple that up to electrons moving on exactly the same lattice, and here they are. And uh, this is the condo coupling. And, uh, and the condo coupling can be fra factorized in this interesting way where it becomes an attractive bilinear of chargey spinners. And it's this chargey spinner that really fascinates us. Um, if this thing condenses, it means that you're binding a fractionalized particle, which of course you might think of as an imaginary object, to an electron, which you think of as a real object. But in this system, as I try to convince you, the fractionalized particles are real excitations. And so if I, they exist as real excitations, we can now look at the possibility of binding, pairing between electrons and fractionalized excitations, which allows us for the possibility of unusual quantum numbers, a charge E spin one half condensate, okay? 
And so that's the model. And once you've got this, you can now proceed with conventional many body physics. <coughs> you can decouple this thing in terms of these two component spinners. Here they are. And you can do a mean field theory on that, or you can do, just as we heard this morning, you can do a Cooper expansion in the diagrams. And you can look at the pair susceptibility. And here is the pair susceptibility, so one E pair susceptibility, it's logarithmically divergent, which means that you have a Cooper instability in this charge one E channel. And so this is the phase diagram of this curious system. The moment you turn on J at half filling, you form this charge E condensate. Yeah. And uh, uh, let me just go one more step further. Here is the Fermi, here is the Fermi surface of electrons, uh, which are split into Majorana fermions. This then raises lots of interesting questions. Um, and I'll end with some of those questions. Here is, here is uh, a few more pictures describing what's going on here. Uh, if you actually look at the pairing kernel of the electrons, you have something very interesting because you can, of course, integrate out the Majorana fermions and look at the self-energy of the electrons. When you do that, it's, it's, it's a little bit unconventional, but at first sight, you might say, well, why are you making this big deal about these Majorana fermions? It's a triplet superconductor, excepting <coughs> it has a number of curious features. Uh, there's an on-site pairing kernel, which is triplet, which is impossible unless you have odd frequency pairing. So on site, it's an odd frequency superconductor, uh, um, but it also has the property that you can set an electron moving along, can plunge into the spin liquid and then come out uh, an arbitrarily long distance away. And so this self-energy functional here actually is kind of singular in momentum and frequency space. It has zeros uh, on the Fermi surface of the Majorana fermions. And this is because you can separate out the Vx and the Vy to arbitrarily long distances. This self-energy factorizes into spinners. Okay, and so I think, I, and it also forms a pair density wave. Okay, and returning to the smerum hexaboroid conundrum, uh, I'm sort of wrapping up now. Um, I wanted to talk about what it might mean. And it's possible connections <coughs> with Samaritan Exploit and other systems. <coughs> so, if indeed you can have insulators that um, have quantum oscillations, this is a paradox. It really can't occur according to our standard understanding of metals and insulators. Okay. In our standard model of metals and insulators, the excitations are electrons. Okay. And those electrons respond equally well to the electric and the magnetic field. They can't undergo Landau uh, orbits without also conducting, okay? And so uh, uh, the possibility of an insulator with a Fermi surface is an oxymoron. It either means the experiments are nonsense or we have to come up with a completely new picture. And even if you don't like what I'm talking about, you can ask, well, what would we do from a phenomenological point of view? Uh, <clears throat> one other way to try to get a de Haas van Aert oscillation from a kind of spin liquid has been explored by Chowdhury et al. He's not here this week, but um, you can take a spin liquid and you can notice that the ring exchange is coupled to the external field. And uh, this will then give you uh, quantum oscillations. In my opinion, they're not large enough to explain the experiments, but it still uh, provides me with a straw man to explain my thoughts. Um, and the point is that any such system that's an insulator has to have, first of all, the property that del dot J is zero. It's an incompressible fluid, okay? But secondly, <coughs> it has to have the property that it produces a magnetization and the curl of a magnetization is J. So that's interesting. How can you have a curl of a magnetization if del dot J is zero? Of course, del dot J equals zero doesn't necessarily mean that J is zero, okay? It just means that del dot J is zero. It means the current is transverse, okay? So this then leads to the crazy idea that a phenomenological resolution of the Smerum hexaboroid conundrum, which avoids having to worry that whether the experiments are valid or not, 
um, suggests that a novel fluid that allows divergence free circulating currents, uh, but with an insulating longitudinal conductivity. Okay, to put that into better words, let's look at the conductivity. Recall that in a metal or any bulk conductor, you can divide the conductivity into two parts, a longitudinal part and a transverse part. In a cubic environment, they're very simple to write down. The longitudinal part, so the, first of all, the transverse part has the property that if you take the dot product with Q, you get zero. And therefore the divergence of the currents is zero. But the longitudinal part uh, is the leftover bit. So that is uh, defined by, by QA, Q hat A times Q hat B. So this is a universal uh, uh, separation. In a metal, um, this separation is uh, <coughs> uh, uh, very valid. And uh, this is the term which connects with plasmons. And this is the term that we measure when we do the optical conductivity. And uh, part of the urban legend of uh, condensed matter theory is that as Q goes to zero, sigma longitudinal equals sigma transverse. And so uh, uh, everyone is taught how to calculate sigma transverse and use it for sigma itself, right? So all the theories of localization are built around calculations of sigma transverse, yet the thing you measure is sigma longitudinal. You put leads on and you look at the current going together. They're probably the same. But this is a system where you put, where you put leads on it. You don't see any conductivity, right? It seems to be a very good insulator. And if we accept tentatively that the experiments are correct, then this suggests that sigma longitudinal has to be exponentially activated. It's a good insulator. But sigma transverse, well, maybe that's a druda metal. Okay. Now, anyone who looks at this will immediately tell me that this breaks all sorts of symmetries. Okay. Because in order to have sigma longitudinal and sigma transverse be separate from one another, you have to have a very long correlation length. Or infinite, if you take what I've written here too, which would mean some kind of broken symmetry, okay? Uh, so it's a little bit of a wild thing, uh, but you could test it, you see? Uh, <clears throat> and so here is the uh, optical conductivity. Uh, delta gap in this system is 1.1 terahertz. <coughs> and we would normally expect the optical conductivity to have plummeted downwards here, okay? And yet it's not, okay? So uh, could it be that uh, perhaps uh, you could go to lower frequencies um, and could you perhaps check sigma AC in the megahertz range somewhere down here to see how this thing evolves? Could this be, could it be that this goes to a finite value even at zero, okay? I guess uh, that's what I've done here, I've drawn it in. This is my imagine it, ma uh, imaginary notion of what might happen at low frequencies, okay? Okay, and uh, uh, such a fluid will decouple from phonons and will develop very long equilibration, thermal equilibration times. And one of the conundrums of this system is that no one's ever seen a thermal conductivity associated with its so-called neutral Fermi surface. But on the other hand, uh, specific heat capacity has been measured. Those two things lie in contradiction to one another, and it's perhaps because the thermal equilibration time for establishing a, a, a constant thermal gradient uh, becomes very, very long. Okay, and now going back to my previous talk, let me just end up here with where I was. All right, that one. Yep, broader conclusions. Okay, I think the broad conclusions, which no one's gonna, you, you may be skeptical of the things I told you in the last part of the talk, and that's okay. Um, uh, but history teaches us that physics and the lab and the cosmos are often intertwined. And uh, uh, so this then provides a motivation for seeking answers into some of the things in the cosmos by looking at stuff in our everyday lab and no better place to look uh, than in quantum matter. Um, and uh, I think also there's a deep connection here with highly entangled systems and the possible connectivity uh, with quantum information. And I've told you about Smerum hexaboroid, an old mystery that brings together ideas of topology 
and fractalization. In fact, to understand it as a condo lattice, you have to fractalize the spins. Thank you. Yeah, we have a, a lot of time left. Uh, in fact, that uh, the talk is supposed to end at 3.40. So we have 24 minutes uh, for the discussions. Uh, <coughs> So in, in the last part of the talk, what breaks the symmetry? Like, how do you choose the transverse direction and longitudinal direction? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, it is a broken symmetry state. Do you want to repeat the question? No, no, because he did it with the microphone. Oh, they will hear So, okay. so with, the, with the microphone, everyone can hear it online. That's the great thing about the mic. Um, so, the, but I will repeat it anyway. The, the question is what chooses the direction? And in fact, the thing that chooses the direction is the spinner order parameter. So the electrons components that are parallel to the spinner don't see it. Only the ones that are perpendicular to the spinner, there are three components perpendicular to the spinner, see it, and they're the ones that gap out. And so it is a broken symmetry state, and so should be regarded from that point of view as a superconductor, okay? So how dare I even talk about that in the context in the context of the uh, of ceramics boride. And uh, to be quite frank with you, I don't quite know, okay? It, there is one piece of insight, however, there that, that we've been trying to hang on to, which is the fact that a superconductor is a rather remarkable thing. It has, I used to think that a superconductor, the most important part of it was the fact it has a superfluid stiffness. And, this point of view is emphasized very strongly, for example, in Anderson's Concepts in Solids book, that you need a stiffness there. But it requires one other component. It requires a topology, topological resilience. So for example, an XY magnet is a superfluid. You have superfluid flow of, of spin and you can wind it up as much as you like. But a Heisenberg magnet, ferromagnet or anti-ferromagnet should not be regarded as a spin superfluid because when you wind up the spin, it always unravels, okay? So if you had a superconductor with a spinner order parameter, it would have unusual properties. You couldn't wind up the spin to create, a, wind up the, the spinner to create a macroscopic superflow because every time you did it, it would unwrap, okay? So this would be at the very best a superconductor that doesn't support a macroscopic current, which of course is not a superconductor, right? Okay, right? So what would it be? So we thought, and we proposed this experiment, and it was done in, at, 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 at TAFR in India. We proposed that it would at least exhibit a, a, a Meissner phase at low, at low fields. And they did the experiment down to 10 to the minus five or six, uh, Tesla, no, oh, maybe lower, 10 to the minus nine Tesla, and they saw nothing, okay? They were so embarrassed by seeing nothing that, that unlike Michelson and Morley, they chose not to publish. Um, uh, and so our theory died at that moment as, as a theory of smerum hexaboride. Um, uh, but <clears throat> we are still worried that we maybe made a mistake somewhere along the way, and that the Meissner phase doesn't e exist due to aspects that we haven't fully understood at this point. And so we're still optimistic that a revised version of our theory might yet come back to life. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have, we'll go one to three and there's an online question, so. Uh... Yeah, just a <coughs> question. You, you briefly mentioned valence fluctuations. So how do you think those might interfere with the picture that you put forward? So that interaction yeah, well, I think it's just a question of coming up with the appropriate Majorana uh, slave boson description of uh, Hubbard operators. Um, we've tried to invent such a thing using Schringer bosons and Majorana fermions. We haven't quite got it to work properly, um, but I don't think it's ruled out. Um, uh, in a way, in a way, Majorana fractalization has been thought to be better than than uh, than. Uh, conventional fractalization of spins in terms of fermions because the Hilbert space of the Majoranas is, is smaller than the Hilbert space of, of Dirac electrons. Um, uh, but it does seem that uh, that's most of the time the Dirac fractalization is st more stable. 
in the case of this, what we like about this Yao Li spin liquid is it we're, it's guaranteed that this fractionization occurs. So it raises a number of interesting questions. And one I throw out there is, would it be possible perhaps to find a version of the Kitayev model that has charge fluctuations, a solvable model of the Kitayev model that has charge fluctuations? I don't think it's ruled out. Such a beast may be out there to be found, right? Just as the Heisenberg model was solved in the 1930s and the Hubbard model was then solved exactly in one dimension in the 1960s, it might be that there, there is a charge fluctuation analog of the Kitayev model that's out there, okay? If we had such a thing, we could answer this question much more effectively. So I have again a question about the <coughs> transverse longitudinal uh, um, dichotomy that you mentioned at the end. So when Q equal to zero, you cannot distinguish transverse longitudinal just because the momentum is zero, but any experiment is done at a finite momentum. Mm. So what you are telling us that even if the momentum lies extremely small, it still is larger than the scale where you see essentially the, the distinction between longitudinal and transverse. Is yeah. that what you mean? That, that, would be the, that would be the fallback. The hardcore version is hard to go for because there's no, there's no phase transition in Samarium hexaboride, okay? So, uh, but it might be that there's a long enough correlation then to sort of play these crazy games. Yeah. Hi, Pearson, nice talk. Could, could you just tell us what the status is on the Hall effect in the ceramic hexaboride? Because we've talked about, you know, sigma xx, what about sigma xy? Um, the Hall effect that's been measured is, is the surface Hall effect. So I don't know, anything about the bulk Hall effect of this system, because it's short circuited by the surface. Um, so it raises an interesting question whether the Corbino geometry measurement could be used to measure the bulk Hall conductivity. I don't know whether that's possible to do, but it raises an interesting possibility, but, oh, I don't, oh that's a good question. I don't know, I don't have a prediction, um, but, uh, I suppose what you're saying is that, uh, uh, I mean, presumably the whole conductivity of the bulk is a transverse conductivity feature, right? So I think it would have a one over any, oh, I'm, I'm completely, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at this real time uh, response. If the transverse metal were a real concept, then I suppose you would have a, and it went all the way to zero frequency, then you'd, ha then you'd have a sigma xy. It, uh, but I don't know whether you could measure that thing uh, except optically. Uh, you could measure it optically, of course. Gersh and I have discussed a little bit this possibility. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have a, one online question. So let me just uh, read. Um, <coughs> it's hard to understand the question. So let me just interpret it. <laughs> so it's, a, um, it, it's hard to see this. Well, actually, basically, the, your Hamiltonian is uh, spin, spin, and orbit, orbit interaction. Uh, probably weak compared with the spin orbit interaction. So Hamiltonian that you have written, sigma yes. dot the sigma, lambda dot the lambda. Um, I think they interpret that as a spin, spin, and orbit, orbit interaction. So is that weak compared to spin orbit interaction? So maybe you can just oh. elaborate a little bit about your Hamiltonian. Yeah, so so there. so I think they're talking about that. So the 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 condo interaction. <laughs> I don't think I should do that, should I? No, um, the condo interaction is a completely normal kind of interaction. It's a it's it's an interaction with the electron spins and the local moments. But the Yao Li model has this. Uh, interaction in which you have a Heisenberg interaction of the spins multiplying a Kitayev interaction of the orbital degrees of freedom, okay? And it is fair to say that no one has come up with a microscopic model that produces such an interaction, okay? Um, uh, what I would like is for someone to say it's impossible because that would probably lead to it being discovered. But at the moment, we don't know either way. Okay, so maybe it's uh, for me that I can... Is there any other question? Otherwise, I can go with one clarification that I didn't say that it was unphysical. 
<laughs> I said, precisely, there's a recording so you can check. I said, it's a beautiful theory, but it's uh, artificial from a microscopic theorist. Oh, that, okay, artificial. Very good. <laughs> and the reason for that is because the lambda is not an orbital angular momentum. It is the uh, two spins yes. are made out of. So Hamiltonian, as I replied to the Thomas question, is Hamiltonian is made of six spin interactions. So it's not impossible, but from a microscopic point of view, uh, let me rephrase that. I shouldn't say artificial. I should say it's quite unrealistic mm. where it's hard to find it from a microscopic well, theory. So, so what I would comment on that is that samarium hexaboride has a quartet of states. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes. Four states, just exactly the same number of states as the Yao Li model. Okay. And so uh, most likely, if you look at the interactions of those quartets between different sites, it's not a Yao Li model, but I bet you that it contains a component that overlaps with the Yao Li model in some sense, but of course yeah. that would, it's not, not a trivalent lattice. Mm -hmm. And so you'd have to break some lattice symmetry to make it look that way. Yeah. Nevertheless, it has the right number of states. Okay. Right. <laughs> I mean, the reason that I know a little bit about it because I was interested in realizing that such a model. So I'm the one who is interested in how to get that. And one way to get it, you might <coughs> have to talk about the molecular spin orbit. Yes. You have a three site, which has spin half, then you can generate the right number of the state. I and that's how you can- I should talk with you some yes. more. Thank you. So Aiden. it's not like I'm, you know, I, I think it's a beautiful theory and it'll be really nice to get some microscopics from out of it. Okay, I think um, it's coffee time. Yeah, I think it's uh, anyone else? Oh, yeah, we have one because it's supposed to end that uh, we still have a uh, few minutes. So I, I have a quick question about this Condolaris model with the Yaoli model. Yes. That you constructed. So you worked with the Marana Pomeo representation, but I presume uh, you could rewrite the model using complex fermion after you set uij equals to plus one everywhere because the quadratic hammer in the end you have a quadratic hammer or you know, my run of yes. right so then then you could rewrite that quadratic hamiltonian by yeah. transforming back to a oh in, of course and if, i mean i so in fact um it went past very quickly there are various ways of going back to regular fermions. Of course, the simplest one is just to is just to Fourier transform, right? And uh, uh, so, yeah. But so, but the other way of doing it would be to, I mean, once you write Majorana fermions in momentum space. Oh dear! Once you write Majorana fermions in momentum space, they of course become complex fermions yeah. in half so of my, their zone. Yeah. So, so, but on the other hand, you could also rewrite, uh, my, you know, uh, minor fermions in terms of like, in terms of uh, four complex fermions. You could, right? but it would yeah. be a projective Hamiltonian. I know, I understand. But yes. if you do so, so well, then I think I, I, I think what happens is that you end up with a projected uh, spin triplet BCS Hamiltonian. Uh, so you have almost a almost certainly because, but you'd have introduce that symmetry breaking by the direction in which you chose to extend your your three fermions in other words in other words you'd have to choose a direction which is akin to choosing a spinner in spin space uh, and the spinner in spin space that you choose would be the direction in which the Majorana fermions are projected out uh, presumably but the point is that by the time you rewrite this way and uh, to the standard hybridization, say, in field theory, or something like that, then basically, by the time you couple these complex fermions with a conduction electron, yes. that immediately uh, uh, induces the Cooper pair channel in the triplet, triplet uh, pairing. That's precisely what you're discovering, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, accepting the first way of doing it is totally artificial because there's no reason to expand the Hilbert space at this point because it's a perfect description of the physics. Okay. Because we actually saw uh, we actually solved the similar model uh -huh. in two dimension uh, when we coupled guitar, just uh, you know ordinary guitar yes. model for conduction electron yes. honeycomb lattice, and that's precisely what happens. So it's not the same. 
because in such a model, a spin flip creates visons. And so it interacts with the gauge fields. Whereas in the Yao Li model, when you flip a spin, you don't touch the visons. You purely interact with the gapless uh, uh, Majorana fermions. There, there is an orange forward in the board. Yes. Go, you go. Uh, I, I, yeah. uh, okay, so I think, I think right, that's here. I'm going to, you know, just uh, we, we will, we, I'll talk I think to you two afterwards. can discuss more. I'll probably have some debate over yes. him as well. Uh, so we'll look at the one Sandra and then one online question, then we'll end that. Okay, good. I, I wanted to uh, draw a distinction between the condo model and the mixed valence model. Mm -hmm. We all know that. Uh, uh, if there is particle hole asymmetry, which is weak in the condo model, it's irrelevant. However, in the mixed valence problem, we not only have spin fluctuations with a given charge on the uh, magnetic ion, we also have charge fluctuation. And uh, it's an exactly solved model that if you go away from particle hole symmetry and stick to mixed valence, the charge fluctuations are equally relevant and the, uh, the low energy excitation of the problem is not of the condo model. It has a singularity at t equal to zero. This, this is an exactly solved uh, model, uh, both by Wilson renormalization group with equivalent results uh, obtained with Thierry Jamachi and Clem Asir and me about 15 years ago. It, it's simply a fact. And it is very interesting in relation to your talk that uh, like most problems whose exact solution, most impurity problems whose exact solution in the limit of low temperature, meaning the ground state and the excitation spectra, has both ground state entropy and singularity in the spectrum, log singularity in the fluctuation spectrum. This model can be expressed equivalently in terms of a localized Majorana and a propagating Majorana. Mm -hmm. So that is that, that, that's simply an unarguable fact of the mixed valence mm -hmm. problem. Uh, what becomes hard is to maintain those symmetries when we go to the lattice. So I am. Uh, so I want to say you can then take this mixed valence problem and try to make a lattice, and then uh, then the problem becomes uncertain. And it's still, however, interesting to look at from the point of view of the experiments that you talked. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Tony. All right. So I think that sounds more common. Uh, I'll, so this is the last question from the chat. Um, like to get us some ideas. Well, have some ideas and help to give to cosmologists to solve their own problems. <laughs> uh -huh. Whether the condensed matter physicists may have some ideas and help to give some, you know, help to cosmologists to solve their problems, for example. Dark matter as an emergent gravitational many body effect with a question mark. Okay. <laughs> now I got myself into trouble. Um, I, I'm not going to comment. I, I can't give uh, advice to cosmologists, but I think there is scope for inspiration in condensed matter physics from cosmology. And we had a lot of fun recently in Premi Chandra. We'll talk about that on Friday, I think. Friday? Yep. Yeah. Uh, using the idea of energy fluctuations as a pairing mechanism. Uh, and uh, one of the interesting things about strontium titanate is that the quantum critical transverse modes don't couple to the electrons unless you have a, a large amount of spin orbit coupling, which is, we believe, absent in this system. And so this is a system where energy fluctuations of the background uh, uh, polarization fluctuations actually may produce a gravitational attraction between electrons that drives pairing. Um, and so uh, I'm not gonna say more about that. If you're interested in this idea, come back on Friday. Okay, so with that, uh, let's thank the speakers again. <coughs>
So we'll have a 30 minute, uh, actually it's about 34 minutes to break. And we're back at 4, 4 10. Now we get some, some coffee.